Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Corey Newkirk. Corey was born in the Bronx, New York. He first moved to California for graduate school in 1995 and eventually settled in Los Angeles, where he began making his work. Newkirk transforms everyday images and objects often drawn from African American and pop culture to explore issues of race, gender, and place. In 1997, he attended Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. He received his MFA from the University of California in 1997, and his BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1993. In addition to a monographic survey at the Studio Museum in Harlem and the Pasadena Museum of California Art, Corey has had solo exhibitions at the project in New York LA Exert and MC in Los Angeles, the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, Locust Projects in Miami, Florida. His group exhibitions include Blues for Smoke at the Museum of Contemporary Art Los in, at Los Angeles, Meet Me Inside at the Gagosian Gallery in Los Angeles, show uh, also in the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the 2016 Whitney Biennial in New York, Seven Dakar Biennial in Senegal, Uncertain States of America at the Astra Fernley Museum of Modern Art, Oslo, Norway. In 2004, California, also the 2004 California Biennial at the Orange County Museum of Art, Freestyle at the Studio Museum of Harlem, and many more. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Corey Newkirk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me okay. I will try to project this evening anyway. So first, I would just like to thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a, it's a little cold for me, at least. And I would also like to thank the sculpture department and uh, Rebecca Ripple for uh, bringing me here to have what I would now consider a very unique uh, Cranbrook experience. So thank you all for that and particularly to the students in, in that area for um, uh, putting up with me and uh, tolerating these uh, studio visits that we had, which I enjoyed to an incredible amount, and the students in the other areas that I had the opportunity to visit too. Thank you. All right. So um, I hope we're going to have a great time tonight. Uh, first, what I would like to say is, uh, I, if you have any questions about anything that you see, please feel free to stop me when, it's, when the image is up there. Uh, there's a, quite a few images we're gonna go through tonight and uh, it would really be a great help if you have a question about something you see, just feel free to either raise your hand or go, hey Corey, like stop, I have a question about that thing or just shout it out so that I can address it when the image is up there and not like talk about the second thing we see after we've seen like 70 things because my brain doesn't really function well in that kind of rewind. And so uh, does that make sense? Great. So we can kind of think about this like a conversation perhaps. Uh, so let's get started. I'm gonna go back a little bit, not super, super far, and then we'll see how far we get in the allotted time because I'm getting hungry and the, there's dinner to be had and com a more conversation to have. So let's just see if this starts here. So here we go, we're gonna go way back to um, grad sort of graduate school so, so that uh, we can talk from uh, 1997 to now. So that's a long time. I'm sure there are some of you out there in the audience who were not even born yet. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, congratulations uh, on that. So I'm just going to start here because this is a, a, a piece of work that speaks to uh, in a way to the direction that my work has taken since then and, and sort of the uh, soon after the uh, massive change in my practice in general from really sort of one type of concern 
about what I was making into something completely different. So this is after that big switcheroo and that sort of change in which I started to make work um, about a different type of thing. And I, I'll just leave it at that. So when I was a much younger um, person, I often would be given these Dick and Jane books to read. You know, it's elementary school that you, you are kind of given a lot of different things to read. But in graduate school, I um, was really trying to interrogate my own sort of upbringing, the things that I had been exposed to, the things that I, uh, that were really trying to make me into who I was at that time and make me into the artist that I was trying to make art about. And so I got my hands on these, the, a collection of these Dick and Jane books, even though his name is Mark. Um, and I decided that um, I really felt that it was time to make these things speak more directly to me and my experience. And so here we have Mark, uh, and he is blowing hair bubbles. <laughs> so these are uh, actual book pages, uh, mounted book pages, where Mark is uh, blowing these hair bubbles, and that is actually my hair, taken from my head and applied on the picture, you know, so that he now is playing with some notions of sort of who I am and my identity. I, I don't think I have to get super, super specific. You guys are smart people here, All right? So Truth's really trying to play with sort of some questions of materiality and how I can use sort of specific things to talk about some other specific things. I think this is Mark again. Perhaps this is Mark and his dog and the friendly police officer um, handing him this wonderful ball of, um, of hair, right? <laughs> awesome, I guess I'm on the right track. Um, handling, handing him this wonderful thing and you know, trying to figure out like what kind of conversation not only are these two having, can they be having uh, with the things that are occurring in this picture but what kind of conversations do we have when we encounter something like this? What kind of questions are brought up? Are answers brought up? Just what the heck is going on? So, and also using just like, the, you know, at this time I was really using what I would might consider certain very specific markers of identity, like um, specifically like the hair, there is work that might come up that talks about my uh, specific marker of identity, my fingerprints, um, you know, s the idea of the skin sort of coming into play. Lots of things get thrown into the mix to try to make certain kind of conversations. This is also from um, that sort of graduate school time. Um, I grew up uh, in central New York and New York City, and my father um, really has this thing for Cadillac. So this is perfect, right? Because I'm in Michigan here. There is a Cadillac Michigan somewhere around here. Am I correct, right? There's Cadillac. This is a very American car. It has a very particular history in, in the United States and with certain uh, different populations. And so I was really interested in the idea and of who gets to drive this car, who doesn't necessarily drive this car, where one might see this car, who one might see driving this car. I, I made a large body of work about a Cadillac, right? My father loves his Cadillacs. He loved to um, always seem to have a Cadillac. There was never necessarily new, but there always seemed to be his car of choice. You know, I, I understand that. Now more in terms of some aspirational issues, but I would also often hear those little um, sort of stereotypical uh, statements or phrases about like, and questions and issues about like Cadillacs and housing projects and the idea that th there will be this car, this certain type of car outside of this certain type of uh, housing situation. And uh, of course that's 
I'm sure probably built within some aspects of truth within there, but it also becomes this mythical sort of statement and again, sort of stereotype. And as a believer that I come from a long line of Cadillacs, um, I created this piece, this hairy Cadillac. So this is um, 17 feet long. I went out into the parking lot at, uh, at school and found the first Cadillac that I could find of a certain era. So probably the somewhere in the 80s, because I really like those, those ones that uh, are from that era. Uh, measured it so that I would have the exact length in order to make this piece so that I could have some specificity to it and then proceeded to go to every single sort of black barber shop that I could find in Los Angeles and Long Beach and ask the barbers if I could take the hair <laughs> off of the floor. Now, being an East Coaster, that usually probably would not happen if I was on the East Coast because I think that people would be really suspicious of me asking for this hair and you know, you take the hair off someone's head and it's really kind of a disgusting thing when it is separated from the body. If there's a ball of hair on the floor, it's really gross, but five minutes ago that was attached to a person and it's the, perhaps the most beautiful thing. And that there is an innate power that can be attached to that hair clump or that hair and just really trying to use that. So I collected all this hair, swept it up off the floor and was happy to discover that um, the most popular food in these barbershops was sunflower seeds and rice. Like those are the things that I ended up picking out of the hair mostly. Uh, collected it all together, this has none of my hair, dyed it all, washed it all, dried it, and then proceeded to mount it uh, on something and then mount that, that this on the wall so I could, would end up with this giant hairy Cadillac. Right? At this point, I discovered that uh, there, something that I really like about my practice is that sometimes there is the work. There is work that functions like this in these spaces and can do this, but at other times there is sort of almost the detritus, the other work that comes in the work, not just the sort of uh, hard work of washing and drying and picking that food out of the hair, but the other thing that happened in the time when I really figured that out was with this piece where I walked around campus for the next two weeks with very hairy palms. I, you know, right from the making of this. So this other piece happened. Sadly, I don't have a picture of my very hairy palms, but I'm sure you guys sort of can imagine what someone would look like and what that means to walk around with hairy palms. Um, it's rather strange, but Using that idea, um, and I'm not sure how much is in the rest of this, that I started to understand that I can have a, sort of a, a shadow body of work from the work that is made from that work and which will produce these other things at the same time. But we'll see. <coughs> All right, so here we are. We've jumped ahead a little bit. I can't exactly remember what year this was, but it was after that time. And uh, what was that? Did I hear someone answer that? No? I think it's uh, 98. It's after school. So perhaps one of the first or second opportunities that I've had after I've gotten my MFA to actually uh, present something. And so here I have nine giant hair picks, they're all my height, trying to, re again, directly reference myself and my body, um, making this circle, it is, uh, it functions in my mind as a giant crown, right? So it comes from a place of um, sort of self-love and, uh, and self-acceptance and sort of enjoyment to make like, what kind of crown would I wear? What kind of crown would suit me and who I am in this way? And then again, directly point to my particular experiences. And that is this piece, which is called Legacy. So I really liked that from the outside, you get a one total feeling. You know, when I was making this thing, you would get one uh, sort of that pro-love, sort of happiness, um, self-love, 
sort of feeling. But once I stood inside the few times, it, the whole mood sort of changed and this thing became like a cage or a cell and it became far much, far more dark in terms of the, the energy that that thing was putting off. And so one, I don't never let people inside of it anyway. It's not really participatory in that way, but just the idea that, you know, and the understanding that work can put off different things depending on where you are in relation to it and where your body is in relation to it, I think has um, continued to resonate really strongly throughout my practice. Yes. Um, the material at this time was, um, it's just foam and resin. So in a way, I, I will say that I was really trying to make a surfboard, right? This is m part of my version of sort of uh, how do I reconcile the location where I am, at, you know, being not so long in Southern California and trying to sort of how do I find my way through a culture that is dominated with cars, hence like a Cadillac conversation. How do I dominate or uh, enter a conversation into a culture that is really surf oriented where I am from a place where it is cold and snowy all the time. So in terms of the materials, I, in my mind at that time in the making of this, I was really thinking about, oh, this is like my version of a surfboard, right? I'm gonna take this foam, I'm gonna mold it in a way, I'm gonna cover it with resin in the same sort of mental mythology, mythology that a surfboard carver would make and try to sort of see if there could be some kinship, some connection, some, some weirdness, if that would help me sort of ground myself in this very new and particular location that I was in, but still retain sort of my coriness, perhaps. So. I will say that version, this one you're seeing, the, this is the, uh, is out of that. It, one of the things that happens when you're, you know, you're young and you're just making stuff is that things are not necessarily made to last forever. And so as this was deinstalled, it sort of got destroyed for the most part. But then um, luckily someone wanted to purchase it uh, a few years later and so it just got refabricated in wood. So now it exists in a much more sturdy version, but this one is the, uh, you know, there's something, as I've been talking to a lot of you today about uh, immediacy and urgency, so I just had to make this thing out of whatever is gonna get me to that point and not worry that it will last forever, but luckily um, someone came t around to me who said we want this to last forever and so we figured out a way to make that happen. All right. Um, this, uh, this early work is so interesting to me. I don't get to talk about this that often. So along at the, at the same time that I'm, I'm using those, uh, these tropes like hair picks and uh, Cadillacs and hair and other ways to talk about uh, who I am, what I am, what I'm doing, what I'm interested in, um, I have this piece. This is a, another Cadillac piece, another version of that. But this, another part of that large early body of work, this is um, a Cadillac made out of hair pomade. You know, it's the stuff that people put in their hair, right? And so it, it's like, I think about it as a material that uh, functions for me in lots of ways in that it has the potential to destroy the space that it's put on, right? Because this is an oil-based material, petroleum-based, it will never dry but it will eat into the drywall and the only way to sort of um, remove it is to remove the drywall for the most part. Um, it, you know, like that it soaks in there, it marks everything, right? This is a, a material that I have uh, pigmented so that um, it not only uh, pigments the material which has a smell which permeates everything once you walk into the space where one of these are so that um, you not only see it, but you actually smell it, right? And I think that the scent is one of those really uh, compelling senses that we have and can be incredibly powerful in lots of different ways. Um, 
So this is the, this piece uh, being put up finally by somebody else. Uh, in a way, it's the stencil would be pulled off in this crisp outline again uh, of a certain era of a Cadillac made out of this material that is very, very, very sort of deep black that is begging you to touch it, to participate with it, but even though you're not supposed to, but knowing full well that if you do, you become marked in a way. Uh, and then the great part is not only does it destroy the walls, but when people touch it when they're not supposed to, they t always want to wipe it somewhere else <laughs> in these institutions. So uh, I feel as though uh, things get disseminated, right? My, my stuff gets spread out throughout these institutions when these pieces, these pomade pieces are up. I don't make them so much anymore. Like that one was uh, given to someone and was put up in something. This is another large scale one. This is, I think, from 2001. This is this giant pomade helicopter. <coughs> Again, the material directly on the wall when the it's only up while the show is up, so it's also very ephemeral. It, it only exists at that time and comes down and either is disposed of or, um, well, yeah, it's, you, uh, sorry, not either or, it's just disposed of. And then it will not exist again until it goes back up. Here's a, the, uh, another version of one of these pomade pieces. This one really taking into account the notion that I was talking about about how this material might mark the viewers. This is, uh, I think, Mocha Cleveland in, I think, 2004, where I was invited to do this show and really walked into this round gallery and thought about um, the idea of who gets to touch the space, who doesn't get to touch the space, what does that mean, uh, when one is allowed or given permission to like put our stuff all over these, these places. And so I felt that it was a really interesting moment for me to blow up my fingerprints and then create them out of this really specific material, this pigmented pomade that would not only uh, permeate through scent the whole institution, but also practically destroy the gallery that it was in. So then that whole thing has to come down and get rebuilt. It's, you know, it's not like I spend my time thinking, how can I like wreck institutions? But it just, uh, for the work, it's okay. It's not something that I do consciously, but also the great thing about this, again, is that it marks the people who touch it. So not only is it my fingerprints, but what happens is uh, people always want to touch these things. So you would touch it and the pigment would go in your fingerprint, right? You'd wipe this grease, you'd be like, oh my goodness, this greasy thing is on my hand. You would wipe it off and what would happen is the pigment goes in your fingerprints and then you are marked. And then again, most people would walk through the rest of the museum like trying to wipe that stuff on the wall, right? So, so that not only do my fingerprints permeate this room, but the, everybody else is complicit in a way in spreading their own uh, fingerprints throughout this institution and this greasy stuff. I think that, you know, that's some something to think about. <coughs> um, as an interdisciplinary artist um, and coming to an interdisciplinary place, I'm going to talk about some other things that aren't fully object-based, but that is the majority of the talk. Uh, this is, I'm gonna talk briefly about these other things and we'll concentrate on most of the objects today. So this is a self-portrait. Um, I taught high school in uh, South Central Los Angeles for quite, a, for quite a while and in my conversations with my students about um, trying to identify where they saw themselves in popular culture and through media and how one sort of can identify or not identify, misidentify, disidentify themselves and your own sort of being through the lens of popular culture. Um, sort of this work and a few of the, the things that I might show right after this came about. So I also love 
the show Cops, right? I've been watching that television show probably since the late 80s when it uh, came on the air. There's just something that's so fascinating about that television show. I also really loved this television show called LAPD Life on the Beat. That is no longer um, on television. But in both of those shows, they would depict the suspect in a different way. So in one of them, the suspect's image would be pixelated like this, and the other one, it would be digitally blurred like this. So I just sort of inserted myself into those positions, right? Into the positions almost as the suspect, because, you know, if you see me, there we go, you, it might be easy to um, quickly identify uh, or misidentify me as the suspect. I am more likely to be um, looked at that way. And so it was uh, my idea to put myself in these positions. And it's also coded gang-wise. You know, there was a conversation about that going on in, the, in Los Angeles at that time. Sort of crip identified in my normal uniform of white t-shirt and a blue shirt. And then sort of like a blood sort of situation with the same sort of uniform, but with the red and the blue. So those things don't necessarily get talked about that much anymore, and that conversation has shifted into another sort of uh, version than what was going on at that time. I do do a lot of self-portraits. I do, there's a, a large thread through my practice of that. And at this time, uh, when this was made, and for quite a while after that, um, it's really never been about um, me as an individual, even though it is a self-portrait, my identity at specifically as Corey has been usually obscured uh, so that I, it doesn't function as a necessarily a picture of me. In my mind, it's really trying to talk about something much larger and maybe what I, I, such an image represents or what I can represent or cannot represent in that way. <coughs> Excuse me, right? less about Cory Cory and more about like, what does this image mean? Even though we know it's Cory, right? So like how, how does one read this image with the idea of not being able to identify it as one person? Can it still function in the same way? So I don't quite remember what year this photo was taken. Um, but also kind of coded in lots of different ways, which I'm not gonna talk about too much. Oh goodness, well, I gotta speed this up. Okay, um, so this image, I don't often talk about this body of work that much and there's not that much to, to show. Um, I am a tall black guy, if you couldn't tell. Um, and living as a tall black man, it is often my, uh, it is often assumed that I like basketball. I can't stand basketball, right? I don't wanna watch it, I don't wanna play it, I don't wanna hear about the scores. Uh, you know, the beer for breakfast crowd that used to hang outside of my front door would always ask me if, like, if I watched the game last night and can they get the sports section from the paper? And of course they could have it because I didn't necessarily care about that and I was not about basketball, but this, assumption that I would play, watch, participate in this sport for my whole life has just started to get to a point where I realized that that seemed like the basis for some serious investigation and some work. And so here we have, uh, look, I found a laser pointer here, so I'm gonna use it. Um, this is another self-portrait, again, uh, identity as this individual is obscure, but I'm sitting in the bleachers as the worst basketball player ever. The, the crowd is left, the coach is left. It's just me left there on the bleachers, sitting there in front of what is meant to represent. Uh, do you know how like in cartoons when a character even steps in any body of water, whether it be a puddle or the ocean, all of a sudden the shark fins come up and they start circling and what that means and how that sort of portends danger. 
That is what we have here, right? These half-sunken basketballs that are meant to sort of operate in the same way that those shark fins pop up in the, in the cartoons and start encircling that character, right? Do -do 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 right, these things which mean that something bad is going to happen. That is how um, my life and basketball go together. Here's another, uh, another quick basketball piece. <coughs> this is far more recent. I think the basketball work was, was a long time ago, uh, but I had some more hoops left and uh, created this piece which at the moment is in uh, North Carolina in some show about basketball. This is a, basket, a regulation height, so that's 10 feet, a silver plated or nickel plated basketball hoop, some shoelaces that I have articulated so that they uh, look sort of worn and dirty, uh, woven and knotted uh, to replicate the exact uh, proportions of a basketball net and the exact uh, weave that that happens that all fall down to these tin cans that have, um, that are sort of function like tin can telephones. You know that sort of, you put the tin can and the string in there, you can have these kind of conversations that function like tin can telephones but are uh, filled with a particular black colored glitter that I imagine is what the inside of all of our heads look like. Um, so it's really a dark, dark glitter with little bits of all these other colors as that sort of in my mind operate like the synapses in our brain. And then um, these two brown balls down there that just skim the floor. Named after my father who actually liked basketball unlike myself. Um, this is a, a box kite made in collaboration with the Fabric Museum and Workshop in uh, Philadelphia many years ago. All I will say is uh, this is kind of based on that earlier pixelated portrait. It's sort of another slight version of that. You know, at the time that this was made, I was really uh, thinking and questioning and curious about issues of, um, I think, mortality and... Um, ever shifting things. So I, I came up with this idea uh, for this kite and really trying to think if this thing were to fly, it's built to fly, made to fly, made to, you know, I don't know if it's regulation, but made to the specifications of a box kite to fly so that if this thing were to actually be launched and start shifting that the face the image on there will come together depending on how the, the kite is lined up and how your body is in relation to this object that's floating in the sky. But if either of you sort of start to move and shift in either direction, the possibility and potential for the image to dissipate uh, increases, right? That there's probably a sweet spot as you occur, as you watch this thing or as this thing observes you, but then as soon as you shift out of that sweet spot, the, the thing is gone. Um, I don't know if that was super successful because I've never seen it in the air, but I, when we hung it there and I just moved it around, it, it sort of did it enough to, to sort of, again, talk about some issues of mortality, talk about sort of, ideas of who I am, what I am, how I exist in the world, how I am perceived in the world. Yeah, there's some other things all down here, but you know, these we're not gonna talk about. We might talk about that. Um, but yeah, just this uh, crazy uh, hand-dyed, uh, all those panels are hand-dyed box kite. Which way am I going? No, nope, wrong way. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this. <coughs> so, like I said, I grew up in uh, central New York, uh, where it's very similar to where uh, the location where, where we are now and very similar weather. So as much as I am now a, what, uh, a lover of the desert weather, uh, I grew up where it is, you know, lake effect snow is a, a part of my winter life. And my father would always be yelling at me to put a hat on when I would go outside. He's like, 
put a hat on, you're not Nordic, we're not Nordic, you know, you better dress for this weather, and you know, that sounds kind of ridiculous now, it sounded even more ridiculous then, but there is a little grain of truth in that, because I really don't necessarily look Nordic, but I could still go outside without a hat on. But that sort of comment, much in the way that the assumption about me and basketball sort of spurned a body of work, that sort of comment and the thinking about um, that and the other sort of white things that could kill me sort of begat a big body of work uh, that I think I have a few more images of. So one of those pieces of the body of work was these icicles. These are neon icicles that are made to hang from the ceiling. I'm sure most of us here have had experience with these, those giant icicles that have the potential to kill you as they fall off the corners of buildings. You know, I was thinking about that and also thinking about can I make something that is, that we understand to be freezing cold out of something that we understand to be blazing hot but still retain some of the coldness but still sort of hint at the hotness. So we have these, you know, these draped neon icicles. So the other white thing that could kill me besides the snow is great white sharks, right? So thinking again about what are the two white things that can kill me, snow and great white sharks. And the great white sharks sort of come into the conversation, again, trying to deal with sort of notions of stereotypes and statements, you know, like black people can't swim, which I am living proof that that is not true. Um, but, you know, as I would hear these things uh, in the ether, right, they sort of resonate enough in that they can spurn on a large body of work. So here we have like this great white shark model sort of carrying and or devouring this snowflake, right? That these are, this are the two white things that could kill me. Here's another sort of quick shot of that installation. There's the neon icicles on the ceiling and down below is this eight foot long um, snow covered great white shark with giant icicle teeth. You can't see the teeth, they're on the other side. So as sort of a version of a snowman, but really trying to talk about like, well, snowman's not gonna kill me, but a great white shark snow shark could do the trick, right? And how do I, and trying to combine again these things into some sort of a narrative about like uh, things I'm afraid of or were afraid of. Okay, what have we got next? We're okay for time, right? I should, I'll, I'll try to speed this up so we're, we're not in here for like two hours. So <coughs> I tend to be known mostly for these things, these beaded curtain, um, things that I call, I call and consider sculpture, but I think a lot of people uh, consider them paintings. I like that it can be either or and both at the same time. I uh, would also consider myself uh, a painter who doesn't paint at times when I'm working on these because it lets me sort of have kind of a painting conversation without having to pick up a paintbrush, um, which is something that I've been uh, working on since my undergrad days. Like how can I make these things that look like paintings without actually having to pick up that tool that I think is the bane of my existence, a paintbrush. But um, the language that surrounds painting is very kind of important to me and I think informs a lot of things. Um, and I can, like I said, I consider these sculptures because they are three-dimensional and they hang off the wall and it just helps me be sane if I don't have to think about them in like paintings. So this is the first one that was ever made. This is eight by eight feet. It is uh, entitled Jubilee. This piece uh, was uh, with those two first self-portraits that I showed, the pixelated and digital, digitized ones in terms of their location with that as a really as a love letter or a conversation to Los Angeles because in a way the place is always burning. Right, I think that it's burning now, it was just burning, it was burning at this time. 
I think that place will always burn. And so this is the first beaded curtain that, that was made that's rather um, pop-oriented, right? All these flames about this place. It's really um, synthetic hair. It is real hair that I get from the beauty shop strung on these, uh, on these armatures trying to create a picture. So after that first sort of pop inflected curtain, the next few, I started to really figure out like what, and have to question myself, well, like what kind of things do you want to make with this? With this type of work, with these materials? What are you really trying to say? Is it something that is pop oriented or is it something else? And I realized I was far more interested in talking about something else, right? I, f I felt that while the materials, these beads and braids were very sort of urban, the images that they depicted should be something else. And closer to the reality of my experience, which is sort of suburban, rural, and exurban, and that perhaps the images that needed to be depicted on these curtains was closer to that, right? To, t to really play with the dual nature of of my upbringing. So here's just a quick uh, close up of what happens of these beads. So about four of them vertically is about an inch. So four of them make about an inch and uh, about 20 to 21 braids uh, horizontally is about a foot. So things like this, that is I think close to six or seven feet across and probably the same thing if not longer up and down. It's not exactly square but it's not that big. Um, all of, none of these are painted. All of those are the color that you see. It's a really, really labor intensive process. Like if you were to tell me at the time that I was uh, sprinkling hair on things that I one might be making landscapes and then uh, on top of that making work that required the amount of labor that goes into these, I, I you know, I would have, uh, certainly not believed you, and uh, certainly sometimes can't believe it myself that this is what I, uh, I make and that I enjoy making and I sometimes get pleasure out of making. This, is, this and the last one are from the sort of second iteration of the curtains, like the, actually the second and third and fourth ones that actually were ever brought into existence. There's some sort of narrative, right, about a long uh, walk at dusk that happens. We see the, the urban, the suburban, sorry, not the urban, the sort of suburban house, the roof line. This is a, a line of trees for uh, along that walk. I don't know if I have the other one. I'm just going to show quite a few more of them in the interest of time, and I don't really want to talk about a lot of these things so much anymore. I don't make them that often, but I just like to I will just show a few to, and talk about them as I go through them. Right. You know, more suburban sort of imagery. Uh, some sort of modernist house. You can see how the, the making of it down there, that one, uh, it, has, it has been trimmed, but you're, you're seeing more of a studio shot. So you're learning some of my secrets, not a lot giant playground. Winter. Uh, one of the very few sort of urban inflected ones. Sometimes they're abstract. Um, after a while, here's a, a some one more recent, uh, giving myself a challenge. This is just a little detail. If I could sort of depict a waterfall and make it look like it, it was not just super static, right? So after a while, they had to come off the wall. I had pushed them into the, cur into the corners. I had uh, made them do a lot of other things. And at some point, they had to come off the wall. And this is the first, <coughs> excuse me, free hanging curtain. So it's four-sided. I, I consider this like the, uh, the Death Star. Um, it's called, I think, Glint. Really, again, it's a kind of just about a nighttime walk that I, that I imagined myself having and sort of putting these things together in this form. 
Uh, here's the second and the largest curtain. To date, this is also a uh, free hanging, free standing. It's 12 feet long on the long side and about three feet on the short side. Uh, my challenge to myself at this point was, can I take a two-dimensional image, make it in a three-dimensional form, but retain its two-dimensionality? Right, so I, I, it's a depiction, obviously, of a swimming pool, really trying to make it still be flat, but actually it's three-dimensional at the same time. Here's the other side. Again, uh, lots of labor. Uh, all get strung by hand, one at a time, going up this thing, and the image sort of forms from the top down. So that's how um, we see it. I can give more details, you know, maybe later. Yes? What, what do you mean, the image from the wall, like on this one? Yeah, there's two layers, right, four things. You know you don't, what I have discovered is that you don't really get too much of the bleed through from the other side. It's luckily, I think, because the placement of the braids and the beads are so close together that while it is, I guess, transparent enough or closer to translucency, but you can't quite see like the, image through the other side. You can't quite see it through here on the picture. But I think you can tell something is there, but the imagery does not um, repeat itself or dub be doubled by what you're seeing. Yeah, it's a lucky break. So it means I didn't have to like line the inside or anything. Whew. Um, so yeah, objects. Oh, another self-portrait, obviously by this time I had gotten over that sort of like hide your specific identity and make yourself into something else. So this is just something from I think 1998, 99, that seems like just yesterday, but I think that's a long time ago. 97, 98, no, 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 that's 2009, that also seems like a long time ago, but I think it is not so long ago. So at this point, I was really, for this piece, really trying to imagine um, and really focus on the idea of regime change. 2009, yeah, probably 2009, right? Like fascinated with the idea of um, what happened in all these countries where the government changed and they would knock down on the statues in the street and the head would break off and go rolling down the street and then you're left with this sort of headless thing. And how does that sort of uh, translate into a sculpture, an object, and what does that mean to have something sort of violently removed or, uh, yeah, removed from one context and then just placed in another? Does the meaning change? So in this piece, I was really attempting to make this uh, St giant stained glass head that looks like it has been sort of ripped from its original location and just sort of dumped somewhere, right? Half of the, the, the glass is missing, it's just leaning up against the wall. What you don't see is where it looks like it's been like yanked out of its original thing and just like placed, placed in this location. It's also my height, you know, I, I always think it's uh, important to directly reference at least my body or the body of the creator sometimes. Uh, not all the time, but when, when necessary. So in 2008, see we're getting closer to now. Uh, we're good on time. <coughs> in 2008, I had an opportunity to have a show uh, in Los Angeles and I was really interested in the idea of um, the connection between entertainment and politics, right? So I thought that, oh, it would be really nice, and this is the summer of 2008, really nice to make this piece that talks about, let's make sure there's no sound on there, that talks about um, that intersection. So what I have here is this uh, large podium. I built this large podium, covered it in, or had it built, well, built, this large podium, had it covered in mirrored 
plexi mirror and with a staircase and this um, curtain behind it uh, and had uh, the all the mic, this bank of microphones that is the top of the staircase sort of chrome plated so that we as the viewer, as we look at this sort of uh, speaker's podium, as we know that there is a very important 2008 election coming up, we can then be, we are implicit in this kind of weird conversation about like um, who's up there speaking and is it entertainment, is it politics, what is going on? We obviously must have built this system somehow because we can see ourselves reflected in it. You know, simple things that mirrors do. Uh, who knew that within uh, the next 15 or so years, after that, we would really be having a conversation about the intersection of politics and entertainment. So, um, I, yeah, that's all I will say about that. That um, perhaps this piece was ahead of its time or behind its time. Who knows? Those conversations could have been going on for years and years and years and decades and decades and decades before. Here's the bank of microphones that was up on top of the podium. Another quick shot of that. Um, I'm going to speed this up here. So this is, I'll just say, this is a shopping cart that sort of pulls a little from that stained glass head. It pulls a little from my love of modernism and the grid. It pulls a little bit from Saturday Night Fever and the disco floor and pulls a little bit from uh, my grandmother's storefront churches in the Bronx and pulls a little bit from how I understand these particular carts to operate in the real world. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, so around that time, 2008, 2009, 10, I really uh, felt that there was another slight shift in my practice where I had really been focused pr primarily with the curtains on notions of, again, the suburban, the exurban, and the rural. Uh, and a little bit of the urban, I realized that uh, that was not so interesting to me anymore, and I really wanted to focus on the other part of my experience, and that being more of the, uh, the urban sort of experience, the big city part, right? I live in downtown Los Angeles like Skid Row adjacent in um, real estate terms. Uh, my family is from the Bronx and Harlem, so I have that uh, really ingrained in my psyche as well. So I really felt that I had played enough with the city mouse version of Corey, and it's time, or the country mouse version of Corey, and it was time to talk about the city mouse version. So here we have a full size version of a fire escape made out of clear acrylic. <coughs> Sorry. It just is suspended from the ceiling. So there, there I am with uh, the fabricator for scale purposes. So just, again, trying to talk about a little bit about materiality, a little bit about who I am, where I've been, how I live, where I've lived, what I've seen, and, uh, and a lot of some other, some other things in there. Where did I see them? Questions? Awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, God, we're just jumping all over the place. This is a bike rack, one of the few public art things that I've ever got to make. Um, I'm just going to show this quickly. I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm super happy that I was able to make this bike rack with an architect. What I found out is that it doesn't often get a lot of bikes on it, but the skateboarders really seem to love it. The reason I'm kind of showing this, and I think I added some images after that I don't think I've ever shown, but to, to sort of briefly sort of show the process, which that's the final iteration, but it has gone through all these other sort of moments in my studio, these prototypes that came before, the ever shifting, trying to figure this stuff out because um, I guess I have the opportunity since I'm up here, like to remind some people that I've spoken to in these past few days that that idea of process and working through the issues in the work is really important. That might show up again later. So I just wanted to share some of that. Okay, we're good on time. 
No one's racing to get out of here yet. I thought I just heard the door. Perfect. <laughs> right. So um, now we're at 2010. So we're getting closer and closer to where we are right now. I had the opportunity to be uh, participate in a show that was uh, based on the billboard. Right. I just submitted this picture. This is one of the ideas that I had. Uh, the other ones were, well, since we, they don't exist and they didn't turn into anything, I don't have to talk about them. This is an image of me with a snowball in my mouth. All right, so th this picture sat around my studio uh, for probably a decade, right? Just waiting for the right opportunity. I can tell you, I, I know I took that picture in probably 2000, 2001. I remember where I was, what I was doing that day, just sat in someone's driveway, took my shirt off, stuck a snowball in my mouth, held a sort of not digital camera up to my face and started clicking and it was like, I have no idea what is gonna happen with this, but I just feel the need at this moment to do this. And you know, look at the pictures, they just sit really on the wall for, like I said, uh, probably more than a decade and this opportunity to have this sh be in this show came and I happened to see this thing on my wall and was like, that is what needs to go on your billboard. So I got it cleaned up just a little bit, but not much, not very, I'm not super into digital tricks that way. I don't wanna sort of fool anybody and submitted this. And so this is my billboard that day. So the thing I always think, which is really strange uh, and interesting to me about this in relation to my practice in general is that um, this was read in a way that uh, nothing that you had seen prior had ever been read, th right, through a lens of something different, right? A lot of people, and particularly um, some people who write for um, newspapers and things, really saw this and thought that that was a cotton ball in my mouth, right? And that I was trying to have a conversation about slavery. Now, I don't know, um, I felt that that was really interesting because I would think that if I was really interested in those kind of conversations, don't you think that the, the 10 or 15 years before this came up that there would be an inkling that I would be interested in those things, that that would show up in the work, that those kind of conversations would be um, going on? But, you know, sometimes there's uh, what I like to call a lazy reviewing. But that's all I will say about that gentleman and his issues. Um, it's just a snowball in my mouth. It's really not about oral sex or anything else like that. It's just me with this thing in my mouth. I will say that that is the first day that that went up, right? The f this image is, I had no choice where it was going up. No one knew where it was going up. This was one of the first ones that went up. Luckily, it's in a beautiful section of town. Look at those palm trees. Like it's right next to a park. I know that this is within the first two hours of this going up because within that first day going up, I got tagged, right? The image got tagged. And luckily, whoever sort of did this tag uh, on here only tagged on the side. So I can consider this like a collaboration, right? Because they, they were actually really respectful of it. And so I, I like that we work together. I don't know who this dude is and his like, what speaks to you? I just happened to find this online and thought, well, that is really interesting that um, I can put myself up there and this image and present that sort of conversation to the world. And then this gentleman sort of asking the question back, but using this as the backdrop and, you know, asking what speaks to you. But, um, you know, it's so rare that I think when we make things that we sometimes can have uh, sort of interaction, conversation, dialogue with the people who actually, that, who we don't know, right? Th with the people who actually see the things that we make. And so I, I feel super lucky that I was able to sort of uh, find this moment and see this thing happening. Um, so yeah, that's great. Um, I'm just gonna flip through this. We're gonna be here for a little bit, so get re relax, everyone, and not super long, but we got a little bit more to go. I'm gonna really take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I will just say this is a, some neon text uh, that I made uh, 
a few years ago talking about things like this earlier today, so I thought I should show it. So this is what you see in this, this woman's house. So again, a, an opportunity to have a show uh, in a very contested spot. So sometimes I, um, we get to make work that is um, site neutral, right? It might just go up on any old white wall or institution. Sometimes it is site responsive. Sometimes it is site specific. This is a uh, work that is site responsive. So uh, in a show where work goes in people's houses and people are invited to come see the work in, their, in these individual people's homes. So this particular home was on the ocean up near Santa Barbara. And I felt that it was super, such a weird place because you know you walk into this woman's home it's a, this loft you walk through it you can see the ocean through the sliding glass doors at the end of it you walk out there onto the, her balcony and right below you is the amtrak train right like right below you this train that goes back up and down the coast and right beyond that is a state park where people are camping so what you see is them hanging up their wet towels and wet underwear right outside your door. So first you have the train, then you have the wet underwear and the wet towels, then you have some sand, and then you have the ocean. And so thinking about that sort of view and that location, I created that piece and mounted it in a way that you can only sort of read it from that patio balcony through a mirror. So again, using the mirror to sort of make the viewer a little bit complicit. So you're looking at yourself, but that's the only way really to read this sign that says no visible neurosis right behind you as you look out, thinking you're gonna look at the ocean, but you see that you're right above the tracks. So conversations about what side of the tracks are you on? And then you see all this wet towels and dirty underwear hanging from the people who are camping also outside your door. And then beyond that, the thing that you're really meant to look at, which is the ocean. So how does that all add up? That adds up to like living in a no visible neurosis situation, I think. Okay, we're good, we're good, we're good. Um, this is a, a pile of my t-shirts, uh, my yellow armpit stained t-shirts that I was never able to throw away. I. Uh, I'm a collector, I save a lot of things, again, never knowing when they might turn into something in the studio, so I don't exactly know how many t-shirts are in there. People ask me often, and I'm like, I, I'm not a counter, I don't do any math or anything, so I don't know how many, there's a lot. But um, I was uh, asked to have this show in another house. You know, I'm not one to, who will turn down a good space. I don't care where it is. If the space is interesting, I can figure it out. So these are all my old yellow armpit stained t-shirts that I had figured out a way to sort of tie-dye the surface of them with particulate, right? And the particulate is the stuff that is the dust on the floor in my studio, the stuff that I breathe every day, the stuff from the highway and the freeway that surrounds me in Los Angeles, I just had figured out how to get these, again, yellow armpit stained t-shirts to end up looking like this. So this is all dirt, right? This is all from the floor of my studio. And then all these t-shirts laid out uh, neck to neck, arm to arm to form this giant oculus. Right, because I was asked to be in this Rudolf Schindler house to do this solo show in this house and really thinking about that as a location and you know, who gets to own these architecturally significant houses? Not really the owner, like those houses will always own you, right? And like, I don't get to sort of play in these places or uh, inhabit certain spaces like this that often and I would always wonder like who actually has to clean this place? Like who would be the one to clean this place of all of this particular particulate? See, more silver balls, you know, these two sort of ball things show up often, sometimes. Who has to clean this house? What does that mean? And how can I sort of talk about issues of labor? Um, again, my body, uh, the dirt, the stuff that we breathe, the location. The piece is called May Day. 
Um, here's another one of those tie-dyed dirty t-shirts. I mean, uh, one of the great things is I ended up with the most clean floor of my studio after making this piece. It's because I had to scrub everything down. This is a, I'm not gonna say too much about this, but this is a shopping cart for the Blues for Smoke show that makes a drawing. So the blue circle that you see on the floor is really, is the piece. So it, even though there is a shopping cart there with an empty IV bottle and a, some two blue balls on there and uh, something else hanging out, I think a blue cloth, the really thing is this is making, this is a tool to make a drawing. And here's some sort of uh, tests of that drawing being made in the studio. So that's the final iteration. It's, you know, it's a drawing about the blues. So it's this glitter, a sandy, glittery circle uh, that has been made by uh, the spillage from this empty upside down IV bottle that is hanging from an empty shopping cart. Again, process, 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 the trial and tribulation of how does one make this thing happen? How do I make this cart into a, a drawing tool? I think here it is, there's the, uh, the bottle that spills out to make that in, in that circle. Um, uh, my version of a sh the Shroud of Turin, perhaps. Um, it's just a, a dirty washcloth, or sorry, dirty paper towel, cleaning something in my house one day. Turned it over, looked at that thing, and was like, oh, that is like the t-shirts. That's like the things you're interested in. That's the evidence of your existence right here in this dirty paper towel. It's like, you know, it is like a little bit about the, the same kind of conversation about what is real, what is not, in terms of like that sh the Shroud of Turin and evidence that is what remains, what doesn't remain. And I just took a picture of it and blew that thing up. I guess I like hands, right? A dirty glove with a bunch of feathers on it that I won't talk also too much about. Uh, found in the street, pigeon feathers found in the street. The glove was found in the street on my bike rides to my studio. I tend to pick up a lot of um, things that I pass to turn them into studio work. Twins, photo, all I'm gonna say. Um, this is a floor piece. Oh yeah, we're good. This is a floor piece. Uh, <coughs> luckily, I feel super happy to have enough space to make things on the floor. We had these conversations earlier while I've been here about like who gets to do things on the floor and what that means if you take up a lot of space that way. Because usually it's like painters and photographers who get all the space on the walls and the object makers who get to like take up even more space on the floor. And the great thing about that sometimes is that it costs more money. But we're not gonna talk about the market today. So this is a carpet made of um, super absorbent polymers. There's those, those sort of clear things that, that you soak in water and they absorb all the water and they get big and squishy. So this is a big uh, sort of almost like a carpet version of that. And into the water, I sort of added some tears and some sweat and some saliva. I really wanted to pee in there, but the, the owner of the space sort of said no. Like, and I, I just thought, you know, one has to pick their battles in these situations as much as I would like to sort of add some of that in there. I get it, you don't want it this time, I, I'll, I'll save it for something else. And the thing about this, here's a close up of what those things look like, is that it's really about the transformation over time. So what happens is that the water evaporates from this as the show progresses so that these uh, super absorbent polymer balls will let loose not just the water that is in there, but again, the, all my body fluids, right? So you, as the viewer, if you see this thing as the water is evaporating slowly, um, in much perhaps in the same way that you become implicit and you get marked by touching pomade, this time you're really breathing um, 
oh my goodness, like we're, we're sharing like a little moment in that way. I, you, are, you are definitely getting direct contact with the essence of me that you see here in, in front of you, direct but yet very in a very indirect way, in a passive way for the viewer. Yes? Uh-huh. Mm. There is no well, there is no real marks on the floor. It's on a um it's on a mat. Right? So it is built on it, it is on something uh that will one keep that shape so that I it won't just they won't just like spread all over, but will also prevent uh this uh precious floor, right, for this space from being totally destroyed. Um, again, sometimes you have to pick your battles, right? If, if I had my druthers, concrete floor, not, no base, somehow figure out to do that and not sort of worry about like, oh gosh, your floor is wrecked. Um, that is w sometimes what, um, that's the chance people take when they deal with artists. That's all I'll say, right? Uh, but these uh, uh, I live over a Vietnamese restaurant. Okay, okay. I live over a Vietnamese restaurant, and um, I like to take and collect a lot of, like I have been saying, a lot of things. So this is an arch or arc, similar to the piece on the floor. Uh, I like circles. I like arcs. These are tin cans mounted directly on the wall, that same sort of black glitter that shows up in a lot of my work these days that has all the other colors mixed in there that directly is meant to reference what the inside of my head or our heads look like occurs in there. So this is a piece called Natter, right? There, there is a, that dude, so we can, again, get a little sense of the scale of these tin cans. This, you know, I'm really into um, the idea that uh, it doesn't necessarily take a lot to make something, right? It's just some tin cans, a little glitter, and some Velcro. It's like three things, and in the materials, you never even hear about the Velcro, right? So it's just like glitter and tin cans, right, to make this stuff. Uh, I think that might be a little bit about some financial constraints that happen, and how do I make something when I ain't got no money, right? But I still gotta make something. Like, how do we solve that problem? And how do I deal with that? Here's another version of a tin can piece. This is called Concord, the same sort of idea, the tin cans mounted directly on the wall that we, so we get to look at them. But this time, instead of round things making a round shape, it's round things making a straight shape. So again, it can function like a drawing. I don't necessarily consider this so much a drawing, but it is sort of like in the vein of like the things that I've shown that are kind of like drawing conversations. Here it is. Uh, I always think it's interesting sometimes to see uh, these things in domestic settings. You know, some people are really brave and willing to buy crazy things like, oh, it's just tin cans and some glitter. I think I want to look at that for the rest of my life, every day. And if that happens, more power to them, and I'm more than happy to sort of help facilitate that. And so there it is. It does happen. Um, not going to talk about this either, um, or this. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, or this. I'll just. We're, there's a few things that I'll talk about, and then we're we're really close to the end. I'm just going to show things. Uh, this, as I talk through them, these are. Uh, this is the prototype first version of this photograph. I've lived on this corner right uh, behind here that you, where you can't see for the past 21 years in the same place. One day sitting on the fire escape, looking at the street, noticed that this um, light pole, one of the only ones I've seen in the whole city was totally um, horizontal. A lot of them do a little curve like that one back there and keep curving, but this one for some reason was totally horizontal. And so I immediately, it came to my mind like, oh, I need to hang a curtain from there. So trying to sort of reference my own work, thinking about my own work, thinking about the what does it mean to be vertical and verticality in my thing, and like what kind of curtain would hang there? So I came up with this idea um, 
that it would need to be some other kind of curtain. So here are, that was the prototype version. And then I, I, I made these other versions with the same thing. So it's called uh, For a Dark Day, this series. So this is the red light version um, where this mylar uh, curtain, you know, uh, is taped directly to the surface of the photograph. I know most um, photo people are sometimes aghast at the way that I treat photographs. Those antennas had things glued directly to them. But in my mind, it's just another piece of paper. It just got a picture on it. Yes? Like on, on, like in the street there? That didn't see, I mean, of course I kind of thought about that, but that really doesn't seem so interesting. And then I thought, well, you know, I could put that up there and then someone's gonna have to drive down that street all the day, every day. And so that thing is just gonna get wrecked. And, and uh, I don't know if I have the, uh, well, I know I have the wherewithal to get the, the Mylar streamers to be that same thing because I use them in that um, mirrored staircase, right, to make that back curtain. So I, I could probably do that. It just didn't seem like that would be what the work, how the work wanted to exist, right? So I was also thinking about um, a little bit about people, a little bit about Christo and Jean-Claude, right, that, that this is almost like a prototype and a, and a working drawing for something, a plan for something, so or like the, to imagine that it would be the real thing, but I don't have to make the real thing when I can make it like this. So this is the yellow light version. They're all different times of day, same sort of thing, just different lights, uh, different color lights and the green light version of that. I like that question though, you know, it, it would be lovely to see that in real life, but like, I think it would be up for like a minute because that's like a big ma a ma major street, like who's gonna wanna drive around that thing? Like the bus goes through that and the whole thing is down. So, but this way we can, we can put ourselves there, imagine it without having to sort of disrupt traffic. Okay, we are almost done. Um, oh, right, thanks for indulging me. Um, this is a piece uh, called, what is this called? Parade? Uh, this is the singular version uh, of the last few things I'm gonna show you, so we are really almost close. So this is, uh, Parade, again, I like circles. I ride my bike a lot. I um, had seen something very similar to this out in, the, in, the, in my neighborhood, in the streets. This idea of using um, compact discs and bicycle spokes to, uh, I'd seen it in one form on, uh, in real life, not in an art context. And, took a picture of it, which sat around also for about five years until I, I figured out how to translate that image that I had taken and the things that I had seen into some artwork. So this is the singular piece um, of this conversation. So that was Parade, this is Republic. So these are 20 feet long, uh, 20 foot long that way. Uh, connected bicycle tires and compact discs, right? With a, with a copper uh, axle going through all of them. All of these tires and wheels still have the, uh, the evidence of their travels, like the dirt that they went through and the mud, and some of them still have the, um, some of the bush or brush, brush that they have gone through. So the, the history that they had, sometimes uh, you can use that stuff to your advantage and sometimes you might need to make it a little more neutral. I felt that what I saw in this situation was important and needed to stay there. So now we're just gonna get some details of this and I think we're gonna, I'm gonna call it a day after near the end of this. So all these different size wheels and tires uh, connected, obviously some with no nothing Right, uh, compact discs are like uh, they're going out of they're going out of favor. They are uh, 
almost obsolete. It's almost kind of an obsolete thing. Very rarely do we use them anymore. But for some reason, bicycles, which are also round and proportional to this, we still use. Right, more little details. And uh, I'm not going to say anything else. We're just going to leave. This is a public art piece that is uh, very similar to a lot of things that you saw before. Vertical curtains, but this time it is clear. Uh, well, we're here we are. These are the last things anyway, so good time. Uh, public art piece uh, within the last like three years, just like the, the bicycle tires, a uh, set of staircase in New York City in a public park. Park. After someone saw the Mylar curtain piece, th I was asked to translate that directly into this public art piece using the clear vinyl uh, sort of strips, the same things that you might see in the supermarket that uh, block the refrigerated section, just hanging them up at 20 feet high, ignore this guy right here, 20 feet high uh, over the staircase to sort of change the view from the top of the staircase, to color the view, to watch these things interact with the wind. They did something that none of the other curtains or vertical pieces did. They had a little bit of uh, interaction and participatory thing with them, but not by me, because there's no like ta-da thing through the curtains. Like you can't just like hang out and walk through them but you can't do that here, but these at least have a little bit of motion and movement and uh, deal with the environment in another way. And here they are in the dead of winter because this thing was up for a, a, a year. That was the day of install. And so trying to figure out how these things, some of these things that I make, how do they exist throughout the changing of the seasons throughout the year? Does it change how we look at them, do is change how the environment looks. Lots and lots of um, interesting questions were raised. And you know what? I am going to call it right then because I think I've held you at almost rapt attention for long enough. And I'm just going to end it right there. So again, th yeah, thank you. Oh, <laughs>